or five hours, you would just shut out the rest of the world. You would be focused on one task. In our increasingly chaotic world, how do you manage to concentrate on a single problem? One very successful economist found his powers of concentration while getting lost in chess games as a child. This is Nobel Prize Conversations, and you just heard Hido Imbens, 2021 Economic Sciences Laureate, who was awarded the prize for methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. He shared the prize with Joshua Angrist and David Card. Hido Imbens is the Applied Econometrics Professor and Professor of Economics at Stanford University. As a young man, his academic career took off when he met fellow future Economics Laureate Joshua Angrist at Harvard University in the early 1990s. But their relationship had a somewhat rocky start. He's now on record as having said that he wasn't actually in favour of hiring me at Harvard at the time. Your host is Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach. This podcast was produced in cooperation with Fundación Ramón Areces. Hido Imbens talks about the beauty of chess, the pitfalls in talking publicly about uncertain data, and the challenge of keeping an open mind in research. But first, Adam and Hido kick off their Zoom conversation by delving into an experience they share outside of academia, parenting teenagers. I apologise for being unshaven, but my 16-year-old has gone off to camp and he took my razor with him. So. <laughs> yeah, that's my 18-year-old did it for a while, but now he's, he's all set with his own stuff. So, Actually, let's start there with your children, because when we last spoke, it was that morning in October when you just heard the news at some idiotic time in the morning. And you very quickly sent me a photograph of the family in the garden looking very happy. And what struck me first was that you had two teenagers who were up and looking bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at that time in the morning, and that's pretty impressive. Yes, that was really a highlight of the whole day, of the whole experience. The kids were very excited. They got up very quickly. In fact, I have a picture of the youngest, the 10-year-old, when I was still on the first call with Stockholm, hugging me, and she was kind of just so, so excited. But then all three of the kids kind of got up fairly quickly and especially when the when Stanford showed up kind of with a team of people helping with the media and taking pictures and taking videos, they really got into it. And in fact, they made them breakfast. They made them pancakes and, and scrambled eggs. We have a lot of chickens in the backyard, so we have a lot of eggs. And they decided to make breakfast for, for the whole crew. And they just got very excited. And then one of the media team had the idea of having the kids talk to me about my work. And they, they made a short video of that. And again, that was just absolutely delightful. The kids were very into it and it just made it a very special morning. It's interesting because um, your 11-year-old daughter, yes, that's the stage at which children are still malleable and they still will jump out of bed if you say so. When they get a bit older, then it becomes a little harder. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think the oldest, the then 17-year-old, now 18 it's clear in the interview, he was kind of smirking a little bit. He was kind of not taking it completely serious, but it, it, it just made the video really very delightful where his personality did shine through. I think what's so delightful about that video is how close you're sitting to your children and how very tender the relationship is between you and all three of them. It really comes across. Thank you. Living here through the pandemic the last two years, obviously we ended up spending a lot more time together than we would otherwise have done. And we actually, we ended up playing a lot of games together. The kids really got into these these social deduction games, resistance, mafia, the very clever role-playing games involving complicated interactions between the players trying to reveal information, trying to extract information involving a lot of cheap talk, but they require kind of quite a few players. They really work better with at least five players. So the kids all wanted everybody to be involved in those games. And it led to a lot of very pleasant uh, family evenings uh, over the last two years. Well, it sounds like the perfect 
game for economists who study social interactions. But <laughs> exactly, and they're they're very complicated, and because the kids end up being much better at them than the parents, because they're very good and they have a lot of practice, kind of figuring out these social cues and how to extract the information and how to convey the information to each other without anybody else being aware of what is said, because that's what their whole life is about. Well, what great foresight of you and your wife, Susan, to have developed a whole team to be available to play (laughs) during lockdown. Yes, Exactly. How have you found it professionally to be in and out of lockdowns, semi-lockdowns, not travelling as much over the last couple of years? It was a big reset. So both my wife, Susan, and I were travelling a lot more probably than really made sense. And so it was, in some sense, good for us professionally to kind of not be able to travel for a while and kind of then actually think through what part of the travel we should keep and how we should organize our lives where before that it's easier to say yes to one more thing than to really think through and figure out what the right way of handling all the professional obligations are. And so it clearly turns out a lot of things can be done very effectively over Zoom. Some things may even be better over Zoom. And I set up two seminars that are still running now, two online seminars, one on econometrics and one on causal inference. They're incredibly effective because for these online seminars, you can bring together groups of people who would be very difficult to bring together in one physical location. So you can have one speaker, you can have multiple discussions, you can have shorter seminars, you can play around with the formats. And kind of both for econometrics and for causal inference, there's many universities where there's only a couple of people interested in those things. And so not enough to sustain a regular seminar. And for those people, it used to be much harder to have regular professional interactions with people Mm. interested in the same things. And now with these online seminars, and it's not perfect for all things, but it, it works very well in bringing together these communities that are very spread out over different parts of the world. Hedo Imbens was born in the small Dutch town of Heldrop, near Eindhoven. His father had spent one year as a university student, but had to drop out because he had many siblings and money was scarce. Both he and Hedo's mother worked at the nearby headquarters for the Philips Electronics Company. So neither of them had really spent a lot of time at university, but they were very intelligent people and they raised us kind of with a lot of focus on education. It was very clear both early on in elementary school but later in high school that we were very good at school stuff. All three of us, my brothers, my sister and I, did very well in school and it was sort of clear we would go to university. Why were you good? Did you find it easy? Did you find it... We all found it incredibly easy. It, Mm. It came very natural to us and we were very interested in it. I remember my father kind of setting us, sort of all three of us were interested in mathematics. And so he would give us these these long, complicated sequential calculations to do, which towards the end would involve summing time zero and then only a small number of manipulations after that so he could figure out easily whether we got it right. But we liked doing these kind of long sums and kind of learning mathematics facts and things. And at school, we all loved doing math. We kind of just, in general, really liked learning and it just came very easy to us. We didn't have to work very hard at schoolwork. None of us uh, really, but we enjoyed it. How nice for your parents and how nice for you just to find it all a breeze. Yes, and it was a little different once I got to college. Then at some level, it still seemed easy, but it was one subject taught by sort of a fairly well-known professor at the time when I look back at it now and it probably wasn't particularly well taught it was just very very hard and after the first class we were all in shock how we were supposed to learn that and up to that point it sort of all had come very easy to me and then I realized wow no actually I did I did need to work I did need to really figure out what I was about and I need to put in the time to make that work I suppose that came at a good time. It's it's good to be... You, know, you, you need to figure out the limits and you need to figure out what you can actually do. You need to develop habits that allow you to work hard. And you also played chess as a child, didn't yeah. you? Quite seriously. Yeah, so I was very into it. and It was reasonably good, but not very good. In some sense, 
that was very fortunate because it made me work hard. I think it's, it's very good at developing good work habits, maybe less so now than most of the chess players is at very fast time controls. But when I was a kid, we would play these games at regular time controls, so they would be four or five hour games. And for four or five hours, you would just shut out the rest of the world. You would just be focused on one task. Thinking back now, <laughs> it's very, very hard to find four or five hours where you do not check email, you do not check your phone, you do not do multiple things uh, at the same time. In this day and age, I would think that, um, back to teenagers, most teenagers would find it unimaginable that you would not check your smartphone for four or five hours. That's an extraordinary thing to have had. To yeah, have... it's both something I enjoy immensely, kind of having the, the space to sink into a problem and kind of be able to focus on it for hours at a time. And now it's impossible for me to ever find four or five hours to do that. But even just having one or two hours and knowing that it's actually an enjoyable experience and I, I can do it and I can sink deeply into problems, uh, that's a great skill that essentially I developed at that time through chess. Do you need a special place to do that or are your powers of concentration just such that you can just switch into thinking? It's easier if my desk is reasonably empty and it's easier kind of to do it with pen and paper and not have the computer standing next to me tempting me to check email or do things. Not completely easy, but it's... No, uh, but it sounds like you can do it because I'm just thinking of the chemistry laureate Dorothy Hodgkin from a long time ago, from 1964, she was awarded the prize. But she had apparently a legendary ability to concentrate in the midst of chaos. You know, there could be anything going on around her, but once she decided she was going to think about something, she just thought about it. And it was marvellous to see. And it sounds like you might have a touch of the same, that amidst chaos you can think. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's certainly easier if I put myself in an environment where there's fewer distractions, but I do know that I can get there. In the end, I can shut out the distractions. Sorry to dwell on this, but I think it's interesting. Uh, when you say get there, what's your process of getting into a problem when you start thinking? Are you suddenly there or do you need to sort of go down some path to get into the right zone? It does take some time, and that's sort of partly why it's important to have extended periods of time to get into these problems. So I need to mull it over. I need to look at it from different angles. And then slowly, if it works well, I'm able to strip away kind of the extraneous parts of the problems and get closer to the essence. And then kind of it does feel like you're getting into a zone where you see the problem clearly in your mind. That's when if things go well, you may see get some new insight, get some clarity into a problem. It often doesn't work. It, when I worked on, on some of the, the early stuff with Josh Angris, we worked on it for an like extraordinarily long time, given the simplicity of the solution in the end. But a lot of that was spent kind of thinking through the problem and finding space to get clarity on it, having a sense that there was going to be some solution, but not finding it for a long time. It's tempting to think that uh, it might be hard for the next generation of thinkers to have grown up in the same way. Do, do you worry about that? Do you worry about powers of concentration amongst the young people you're seeing coming through the universities? I, th I think it's particularly early on when all these distractions become available that it's harder to find ways of dealing with them. But once they become this background noise, you may still be able to shut them out, like you described Dorothy doing. Do you still play chess? I do occasionally. I play with my kids now, mainly. Both of them have started beating me. One of my kids started playing some tournaments, and so he has regular chess lessons, and he really enjoys it. Apart from the powers of concentration it teaches and the, just the space to think, how would you advocate chess to those who just haven't encountered it? Because you meet chess players who say they feel sorry for those who just don't know the game. What would you say was, apart from what we've talked about, so special about it? There is a particular type of beauty in it. It's when the pieces move well together, when there's a harmony in the position. 
I remember reading that they did these tests where they showed chess players chess positions. If you showed it to them for one second, they wouldn't be able to place all the pieces on the board had they been placed there randomly. But if it was a position that actually made sense, then they only needed to see it for a fraction of a second and they could remember the entire position. And so it's kind of seeing all the patterns, seeing all the tension and the strength in the in the position that makes it very beautiful to see how the different pieces cooperate. Absolutely. And how fascinating. Yes, the harmony of the visual memory with the cognitive memory. It's a lovely picture you paint. Yes, I remember reading of some chess grandmaster starting somebody out who wanted to play chess by just having them study a log in Central Park and be able to visualise it from all different directions. So the first lesson was learn to remember what that log looks like from every angle, and that's your starting point. So that's the beginning of the visual memory, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was good at the visual memory. I was good at seeing the positions in my head and seeing the patterns uh, there. After going to university in the Netherlands and the UK, Imbens moved to the United States to pursue a PhD at Brown University. But it wasn't until he came to Harvard in the 1990s that his groundbreaking work in econometrics began. Econometrics is the application of mathematical and statistical methods to describe economic systems. Scientists can use societal trends, as well as current and historical events, as natural experiments to better understand the impact of policy on, for instance, immigration or education. By coming up with a new and robust framework for interpreting data from natural experiments, Imbens and his Harvard colleague Joshua Angrist played a vital part in making the results of empirical research in economics more reliable. This shift has been called the credibility revolution. Your friendship with Josh Angrist is an amazing thing to happen, that as very young researchers, you found each other and obviously it just worked. How did that happen? I think there are a couple of things. Um, So Josh had been at Harvard for one year when I came there and he came from Princeton, kind of where a lot of the junior faculty at Harvard actually came from MIT or had been there longer. So they'd, they'd all established their research environment and whom they were collaborating with more than just, I don't think there was anybody else from Princeton there at the time. And so when I came, he was still kind of trying to figure out exactly what he wanted to do as well. He was a little further along kind of in what his research agenda was, but he he was still very open to new ideas. And I came there, I came from Brown. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to be doing next, I didn't have a very clear research agenda. I'd done my thesis, and in fact, Josh didn't particularly like that. I sort of agreed with him later. It was a very competent piece of work, uh, but it wasn't a particularly good direction to go in for the future. So I was kind of very did, open to listening to, to new ideas. And so, Sorry, did, did he tell you that he didn't like your work sort of at first meeting? No, no, much more recently. He told his colleagues at the time. He's now on record as having said that he wasn't actually in favor of hiring me at Harvard at the time. But to his credit, he didn't sulk when I got there when the senior people, Gary Chamberlain in particular, overruled him. And then he was very welcoming when I got there. And Gary Chamberlain said, you know, you should talk to Josh Angris. He's doing interesting things. And you should talk to these people. And so I was I was very open to these, these new ideas. So I started talking to Josh. And Josh was very confident in his agenda that there were interesting things there. And I, I was more skeptical about some of these things. But I thought it was very interesting. And so we spent a lot of time over coffee and then kind of later because we were both living in Harvard housing, we'd go to this, the same laundromat to do the laundry. We'd kind of talk about econometrics, about what were good problems, what were bad problems, what was wrong with some of the work. And it was a great learning experience for me. And it, it got me interested in, in some of the things that he was working on. Mm. And so that we figured out some particular questions that we felt were unresolved, mainly related kind of to his thesis and some of the theoretical econometrics work. And we thought there was something more to be said. And we we spent a lot of time then trying to figure that out. Because again, it came at a very fortuitous time from my perspective. I didn't have a very full 
research agenda. And so I had a lot of room for thinking about new problems. But you were both rising stars, young rising stars. You both were presumably very keen on making your own furrow and making a mark, which would ensure in the end that you get all all the tenure and safety that you needed. There must be in some ways a desire just to go your own way and, and make a mark for yourself, but you decided to work together on this problem. Was it difficult to decide to share ideas, if you see what I mean? No, I was. I did not think of myself as a rising star at that time. I felt Harvard was a very intimidating place. I came from Brown, which was a good university, but wasn't quite in the same category. And, and at Harvard, there were all these, these very senior people that I'd heard of who'd done all these very impressive things. I didn't really feel that I was at the same level. And I was very unsure about what my place was there. So I didn't really think of it very strategically about, no, I need to do this to get tenure. I need to do this to make my mark. I was curious about some of these ideas. I felt I had a lot of time. The tenure clock is about six, seven years. That seemed a long way off. I was kind of interested in finding new problems to work on and talking to people, talking to both Josh and uh, and Gary was a lot of fun in terms of developing uh, new ideas. So it wasn't a particularly conscious decision saying, okay, I need to find people to work with. Uh, It was more about finding people to talk to and, and share ideas with. I was fortunate that I was at a very early part of my career where I wasn't really that vested in the established literature. I, I didn't feel I had to defend that. It was easy for me to explore these new, these new empirical studies and then try and make sense of them. Yes, being fresh, coming to things fresh without the baggage of the past. Is it the case that it becomes increasingly difficult to have new ideas for instance, in econometrics, as you go through your career, just because you you do become sort of saturated with all of this knowledge? Yes, I think that is an issue. I mean, more than saturated with all this knowledge, I think it's more that you become bogged down with all this baggage because you've written all these other things, you've taken all these other positions, and sort of changing that can be awkward if it disagrees with earlier work. It's very easy to say you need to be nimble, you need to not feel like you have to defend what you did earlier, but there is a temptation to try and make it all into one big building that every everything fits together. And that makes it harder to go in new directions that, that partly mean discarding some of the old uh, work. And so mm. that is a challenge. In an evidence-based subject, or a, a subject based wholly on rationality, it should be fine to change your mind. Oh yeah, no, no, it should be. It should be. It, I think people get attached to their earlier work, to, to their earlier views, and they, then they have a hard time changing their mind. That's understandable, but it's something you, you need to constantly fight against and guard against, because th- th- I think that's the difficulty in going in new directions later in your career. The relationship between researchers and policymakers is a complicated one. Results in econometric research can inform policy decisions in many areas, but sometimes science can't offer a simple answer to a specific societal problem. We need to be clear that in some cases, policymakers may ask us questions and the data are just not there to answer these things. And in other cases, we can answer them credibly. So I I think in the end, the big benefit is that there's a lot more cases now where we do get credible answers. In other cases, we know that the results just aren't very credible. It's such a difficult balance to strike, both the relationship between the scientists and the policymakers and then also the relationship with the public. I mean, in a different sphere, we've just seen it. We're seeing it through the pandemic where policy is said to be led by science, but then that is sort of translated in public terms to the science being the fact that leads the policy. But the science is not fact, it's, it's hypothesis. That's a big challenge, and I don't, I don't really know how to resolve that. There's clearly cases where we have great uncertainty about what the effects are of particular policies, but we do have to make decisions now. 
it's not something where we can necessarily wait for the, the evidence to become clear. And mm. there's many cases where postponing the decision is just not an option. And there are legitimate arguments in favor or against, but we do have to make a decision. We do have to find a way of, of implementing these decisions and having the debates be out in the open, which at some level is what you would like from a scientific perspective, may actually make it much harder than to get the public to buy into whatever decisions are being made. I don't know how to resolve that. It's easy to say you want to have these debates out in the open and acknowledge the uncertainty, but that does have real effects in terms of people then having the ability to say, well, but there's uncertainty about this, so I'm not going to abide by this policy. Actually, that raises a very interesting question because there's a laureate in medicine called Michael Levitt. Sorry, he's actually a chemistry laureate, but he's a biochemist. And he, for the first year of the pandemic, published evidence-based data which showed that the pandemic was not going to be very bad. And he's a computational biologist. So his data set was strong and his tools were fantastic, state of the art, and he got it wrong. And he was actually closed down. People like Francis Collins came out publicly and said, this man should be stopped from talking. But he was presenting data to the best of his ability. How do you have that debate in public? Is there any way that scientists can talk to each other about the real difficulties of interpreting complicated data in a public space? Or is, is that just a total no-go area? And for the problems you deal with as well, in some cases, in some pieces of policy, I guess it's really very sensitive to present the uncertainty behind the data that you're gathering. Yeah, no, it's easy to take the true numbers that present them in different ways that make them misleading. You know, there's sort of all these debates in statistics about how to think about statistical significance. But in the end, what often happens is that people argue that things that are not significant are really just not there, as if you're very confident that those are zero. And so having these debates takes some amount of sophistication. And so exactly how you frame the debates there is very tricky. And in the current world, where it's very easy for people to get a lot of attention with outrageous statements, that creates a lot of complications. What do you enjoy most about your work? I love kind of the, the part where I'm actually working on new ideas. also love the actual writing of the papers. You know, the publication process in, in economics is very slow, but one big benefit from, from my perspective of that is you get time to kind of really write the papers well and kind of edit them and edit them again and make them better. And I actually enjoy that part of the, the process and I just love working with the PhD students, kind of with just starting out and working with them on, on their ideas and getting them started. That's in some sense one of the big benefits now that it makes it much easier for me to work with the students. It's made econometrics an even more exciting topic. It was already doing very well the last couple of years, but now that's even more true. And so working with students is just one of the great perks of the job. Yeah, it must be constantly refreshing to have suddenly new young minds come. I started teaching in person again five weeks ago. I was on leave part of last year, so I hadn't taught for 12 months. And then obviously it'd been two years since I taught in person. And it's just been so much fun actually being out in front of the class again and seeing all the students and interacting with them. It's a great job. That seems a good point to stop on, doesn't it? <laughs> well, how very nice to talk to you. Thank you very, very much. Great to talk to you again and, and great to actually see you. I realise we haven't actually seen each other. Well, next time you see me, I'll be shaved and you'll be in Stockholm. Very good. Looking forward to that. You just heard Nobel Prize Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about Hedo Invens, you can go to nobelprize.org where you'll find a wealth of information about the prizes and the people behind the discoveries. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for this episode was Cardin Svensson. The editorial team also includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundquist, Magnus Yulier, and me, Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. If you're looking for more listening, 
check out our earlier conversation with Hedo Imben's friend, co-laureate and co-conspirator in the credibility revolution, Joshua Angrist. You can find previous seasons and conversations wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. 